Recording in progress. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Art 195, 3D Modeling for Animation for the Spring Semester 2022. Um, today, what I want to do is to um, cover some of the basic lighting types that are available in LightWave. They have a lot of different kinds of lights. Um, each one is um, has unique properties. Um, some are very similar, some quite different. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and get started with that. Um, if you'll notice that I have a, a, a simple little um, still life here, something that you might see in your, um, your beginning drawing class. And um, that's what I wanted to begin with, just so you get a sense of what the lights look like. Now, the reason that this is so bright and um, has such strong shadows is that I'm using the default settings right now for the lighting. Um, lighting in uh, LightWave is only available in layout. Um, you can't have lights in Modeler, only in layout. And by default, <clears throat> um, you have, as I said, two lights. One is a distant light. The other one is an environment light. You can choose to use either one. Um, an environment light is sort of, I believe I mentioned it the other day, is sort of like um, having ambient light, but it's a lot more than that. Um, so <clears throat> let's get going with this. I think one of the things that I'm gonna do too, you'll notice that, the, that I use the default um, settings for the sphere and the cone and the cylinder, and um, you can see the facets in those. Um, if you wanted to smooth all of that out, it's really quite simple. If you bring up the surface editor, and I only have the default settings here, and you turn on smoothing, everything looks kind of nice now. I'm going to go ahead and close that, and it smooths everything out. And because I have VPR turned on, um, this is equivalent to a, a preview render. That's what it's doing so that you don't have to actually render the frame. The more complicated your scenes get, though, the longer it takes to get a, uh, an overall uh, um, sense of what your final is going to look like. Um, it will look pretty close if you wait for it long enough. Um, but if that's the case, and sometimes it's just easier just to do a quick render and get a, a preview of what the final is going to look like. So um, I'm going to switch off of VPR for a moment, and I'll be toggling back and forth from wireframe to VPR. And you can see that I have <clears throat> in the upper left-hand corner, here is this um, little graphic icon image here of a light and when we use different kinds of lights the representation of that light will appear different if you want to add additional lights um, you can always go back to items and add where it says lights and you'll see that there are all these different lights that we can add here we can add ambient light we can add um, sunlight we can add an area light um, some of these appear kind of new because i don't remember using sunlight before and before ambient light was a default but um i'll go over each one of them to let you know which one what they do we have an area light which is like a panel of light we have as i said the distant light which is equivalent to the sun i know that this says sunlight but the distant light um, we have the environment light that I spoke about. We have a linear light, which is equivalent to about like a, um, um, a fluorescent light. And um, n-gons, which means that you can turn um, polygons or um, into a light source. We have photometric lights. Um, I've used those before. You have to import them. Um, there are IES lights that are that you can download. Um, in fact, in the gallery that I, <clears throat> I of, of my work that I made, I use those, and they're a pretty accurate. Um, they give a pretty accurate representation of very specific kinds of lights. Point light, 
Um, it's just a little ball of light. We have a primitive light, which I have never used. Um, we have a spherical light, which is just that. It's like a point light, but much larger. And then we have a spotlight, which is a cone of light. So let's go through um, some of the, the main ones first, and we can touch on some of the ones that maybe you won't use quite as often. So right now, um, let's focus on the distant light, which is what we have selected right here. So if I select the light, then you need to come down here to the bottom tab and select lights. And then with the lights selected, you can see that we have two here. We have the light, and I can rename it distant or whatever you want. And we have the environmental light. So I'm going to select distant or the, the, the light here for distant and then look at the properties panel. When you look at the properties panel, there's a variety of things that it does for each and every one of the lights. That it, if you want, you can change the name of it. So when you have multiple lights, you'll know which one is which. Right now, we can just leave it light. The light type is what is controlled here. So we'll switch these on the fly. I'm going to leave it a distant light at the moment. You can change the color of the light from here. So if I click on this little box, or if I use the spinners, I can make it, you know, maybe I want if the sunlight is slightly yellow. I can go ahead and I can change that. And that will really change the overall feel of your scene um, considerably. Okay. So I've gone back to the default white. <clears throat> then with the intensity of the light, it is now measured in lux. Don't ask me what lux are. If there any of you have taken a, uh, a photography class and you can describe to me what Lux means and how it's calibrated, I would like to know. <clears throat> the default settings for um, light intensity are 3.14 Lux. So when you change the intensity of a light, make it more or less, you're going to have to increase or decrease it using the Lux. So it's um, for me, it's all relative. You know, if I want to double the intensity of the light, then I just double it, you know, double the number that I see here. And then what you can do too with each of the lights is you can determine, do you want it to affect the diffuse? You want it to affect the open GL? You want it to affect lens flares? Okay, that's something that you can add with lights. Um, you want it to affect specular highlights. You want it to um, be visible to the camera. If I turn that off, it won't be. The light won't be to the camera. Not what you're seeing here, but to the camera when you render it. And then the last one is, do you want it to affect volumetrics? And these are all by default turned on. And volumetrics is what I showed you one of the first days of class when you could actually get that. Um, feel of kind of a foggy appearance that appears surrounding the light source itself. You can also determine the volumetric samples. I generally leave it at the default two for, for starters. And the default intensity I leave at 100% by default. But then I usually have to crank it way, way back. Um, again, for distant light, you can control samples. You can control the angle of it and you can control the distance of it. So let's go ahead. These are all these variables that you can control with lighting. So I'm going to go back to the VPR. And I'm going to um, select the environment light because I want to turn it off temporarily to show you what that is. Now, in, the environment light is a different animal altogether. You'll notice that we can add an environment. By default, it uses um, kind of a gradient from blue to white horizon and a, a gray foreground. And that's affecting everything in our, in our scene. And it kind of bathes it, you know, all of the objects in these colors. And you can see how the blue from the sky is reflected in all of the objects that we see. Um, it's also now measured, I mean, we, 
It's named in environment light. The color by default is white. It's measured now <clears throat> as a percentage, and that's the way lighting used to be measured in LightWave. So what I can do is I can just turn it off for the time being. I don't want to make it negative. I just want to make it zero. Okay. And the scene looks all together pretty different, okay, when you do that. So now what I'll do is I can go back to um, the, the distant light. And again, let's look at the properties and let's crank it up to make it look, um, I don't know, make it look like we want. If, it, if you want it to look like it's, this is shot in dark or with a low lighting system, then leave it at 3.14. If you want it to look um, you know, bright and white, then what I do is I simply double each of these. So I'll select a six and hit the tab key and see how it affects the overall lighting. And it looks far more intense. If I want to um, double it again, I'll do that. Hit it to 12. And that just blows it out. So it's somewhere between 6 and 12. So maybe I'll put in 8 here and see what I get. So that's generally how I control the lighting in, in my scenes. OK? So the next thing that you want to look at when it's lighted, notice that with a distant light, by default, it was coming from the upper left-hand corner. Now, if you move distant lights, so for example, if I switch back to v, from VPR to wireframe, come on, and I move it over like so, or I move it up, where I move it down below the scene. Let's go ahead and move this down. I'm going to put this at zero so I can see it. There we go. So it kind of got out of hand for me. So let me put it actually below the scene like here. And let's move it over like so, move it over here. So you think it's pointing to the right and it's below, so it's not gonna light the scene properly. If I go back to <clears throat> VPR, it looks the same because it's a distant light. And distant lights, think of them like the sun, it's a big ball of light. So no matter where you move it, <clears throat> it's going to light your scene just the same. The only way that you can change it <clears throat> is by changing the rotation of the light. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back from VPR back to wireframe, because it will be easier to move the lights when I do that. I'll move it back up and over, because I just like seeing it from the left-hand side, because I will be using it for other light sources and um, they will look very similar. So let's go ahead and I'm going to switch back to VPR. But I'm going to switch from moving the light to hit Y on here to rotate it. And now if I change the heading of it or the pitch, um, not so much the bank, which goes back and forth, um, but let's go ahead and change the heading of it. And now you'll see that the shadow will change. So it's currently at 41 degrees. If I go ahead and I hit zero, now you'll notice that the sun is coming directly behind us and the shadows are behind that so that that's how that works okay now one of the other things that you can do with distant lights <clears throat> so let me hit that let me undo that let's go back um, i'm going to go back to 45. Oh, come on. There we go. So I've hit it, hit it back about 45 degrees. Um, <clears throat> notice the shadows with distant lights. 
They are very, very crisp. And it's rare that you'll see an object, um, shadows that are that crisp. So with distant lights in the past, you were stuck with that. That's what you had to work with. But now what we can do is I can come back here and I can look at the properties of that light and I can change the angle of it. Okay, so I'm going to look at the light properties and I want to make sure that I have the distance. There we go. It's coming up here. So if I change the angle of that and it's currently set to point 52 degrees, I'm going to go ahead and crank that up to 30 degrees. And let's look at the shadows real quick. Notice how much softer they are. So when you're trying to match um, the shadows to a scene that maybe you have, you're creating a composite and you want to create and <clears throat> try to match the shadows, and it could be outdoors, indoors, whatever, this with distant lights is how you would do that. So I went from a really crisp shadow to much softer one, one that you would typically see you know, in a studio lighting, even though this is a distant light. Um, and that's how that works. Um, as far as volumetric distance, um, we would have to go back and we'll tinker with volumetrics later. But right now, I would not want it at one meter. That would be pretty close, pretty intense to it. So I'm going to go back and um, let's go ahead and change this back to 0.52 degrees. Now we have much stronger shadows. So these are, for every light, there's a lot of different things that you need to take into account, such as, you know, the, the angle of the light, the kind of shadow that you're trying to create. Do you want it a sharp shadow or do you want it softer? Um, do you want the color of the light to change? On and on and on. It's all of those variables that you'll need to take into consideration when you, um, are trying to match, especially when you're trying to match um, the lighting from a photograph that you're trying to um, emulate, okay, or simulate, I guess. Okay, so that's um, that one. So let's go ahead and change from a distant light to um, an area light. And the lighting is going to change considerably much, much darker. Area lights, let's go ahead and take this off. And I'm going to go back to wireframe. And I want you to look at the representation of that. Notice how it's this rectangle. We can <clears throat> scale it up if we want. We can also change the intensity of it. We can also change the distance of it. But what an area light is, is it's an array of four linear lights. In a linear light is an array of four point lights. So technically we have 16 point lights in here to create a nice, soft, um, evenly lit scene. For those of you who are, have worked in film or photography, you might be um, familiar with these big, broad area lights that are similar to this. So for indoor lighting, for desktop lighting, for um, making your product look really spectacular, that might be the kind of lighting that you want. You don't necessarily want a harsh light. So I'm going to switch back to, um, to VPR again. And with that area light, let's go ahead and crank it up. Right now, it's 8 lux. Well, I'm going to double it again and see what I have. I'm going to go to 16 lux. And no matter how, how intense I make this lighting, come on. I don't want 116, I want 16. No matter how intense I make the lighting, um, <clears throat> the shadows will remain soft. But notice here, if I were trying to, to create an, a night scene, and you'll see that the we see the little square in here. That means that it's being seen by the um, the camera. So if I want to turn that off, you know, visible to camera, I can do that. Sometimes that's really nice. 
Um, no, it's not doing that. I'll say that it doesn't affect spec. There we go. So it's not affecting the specular highlights. There we go. So that's why that's this little dot is appearing. But if you want to create, you know, kind of a, a, a an interesting mood for your um, your scene, that maybe it's an outdoor scene, or even if it is an indoor scene, um, and you want to, um, you know, turn dial down the lighting a little bit, but still get you know get a really interesting mood going in your scene, then this might be the way to do it. <clears throat> um, what we can do. As you can see, again, now, typically I don't change the samples in here. I don't change the volumetric samples unless I'm using volumetrics and I begin to change that. But again, this is um, an area light. So let's switch again. And uh, instead of an area light, um, we already used the distant. We've already seen linear. I want to go back to a linear light now. And it's going to get darker yet. There we go, because if I switch from uh, final render, wait a minute, from BPR, and I go back to wireframe, okay, this is the, the light that we're seeing now. That will not render. Notice instead of that, that large rectangular plane, it, um, the representation of a linear light is just this stick that we can rotate in space. Um, and its position, the position of these will affect how the overall scene is lighted. Um, this, as I said, is, a, is basically four point lights, an array of four point lights. So um, let's go back to VPR again. Let's try another one. And again, it gets much more dim because it's only four point lights instead of 16 that we're lighting the scene. So notice that if I want to light it with a linear light, I'd have to really crank it up. So that's generally not the advisable one. This is the light that we're just, it won't be rendered, but it, what we're seeing right here. So um, let's go ahead and change from linear. Let's try another one. We're not going to use Angon. Um, photometric, I have to download those, but let's switch to a point light. Okay, <clears throat> and a point light is just that, it's a, a little ball of light. And you'll notice that it's pointing pretty much in front of the, the scene here. So maybe to, to light my scene a little bit better, this is what you're gonna have to take into consideration. This is, with the exception of the distant light, this is what you're gonna have to do with all of them, is that if you wanna find out <clears throat> where, um, you know, how the light is affecting your scene. It's best if we go back to wireframe or maybe we go back to um, textured shaded solid. So it's less taxing on the computer, but notice where it is. Well, I'm gonna look at this also from the top view. And so instead of current camera, let's look at the top view to see where this is located. Notice that it's way in front here. Well, let's go ahead and hit T for move. Let's move it closer. And let's move it over here a little bit. Actually, let's put it directly on top of the thing or almost directly on top of the scene. And then let's look at this from the front view. And there we go. Let's move it up a little bit. It's a little bit farther away. You know, if it were a little light bulb trying to light our scene. Now let's go back to camera view. doesn't really cut it. So what I have to do is again, I've gone to, to 16 lux and you can see how each of these, um, with the exception of the distant light with 3.14 lux lights the scene beautifully, but with each of the others, you really have to crank up the lighting to make it work. And this is cranked up to 32. Let's go to 64. And it's <clears throat> really not giving me the effect that I would like because I can't even see any shadows with this. So have I turned shadows off? 
let's go back here. And it is X-ray. Yeah, we do have ray trace shadows. And you can, from here, with all of the lights, you can change the color of the shadows as well. You can also exclude objects, which is pretty cool. Um, you create a fill light so that it's affecting one object more than another or multiple objects and leaving other objects out. So let me go ahead and crank this up again. I'm going to double this one more time. I'm going to say 128. Hmm. Interesting that it's not casting any shadows, and I don't have an explanation for that. It should be little shadows under here. Um, okay. Well, then let's just move on to the other one. So instead of a point light, let's switch again. And let's go to a spherical light. Now, a spherical light looks like a point light, but it's just a different size. And it starts off with being just 100 millimeters. But we can crank that up. So instead of 100 millimeters, let's make it one meter. And if we look at it, um, oh, I know why it's not. Uh, let me go back. <clears throat> let me go back to the point light. Okay. The reason you're not seeing the shadows is that I forgot. I went, I turned it off from um, BPR. Now you can see it. Now it's really blowing it out. That's 128. But notice how the shadows are with it over, you know, overhead. Pretty um, crisp shadows, like the distant light. Um, you really can't change that at all. But let me crank, let me go back maybe 64 and see how that looks. But you can create, again, depending on the lights that you use, you can create very different moods, very different, you know, ambiance for your, your scenes. All very, very important. Now, if you don't ever plan on using volumetrics, then what you can do with some of these is where it says intensity fall off. You can, instead of inverse, inverse distance, we can switch to off and everything will become much brighter when you do that. Look at how it blows everything out. But if you do plan on using volumetrics, then you do need to go back and use the inverse distance for the volume metrics to work. So I'm going to go back to 3.14, which is really your starting place. And that's what it's going to look like with a, a single point light. I did it 2.14. Um, let's go back to 6 and see where we get. Yeah, that, it's a nice soft light. You know, it's like a, a dimly lit light bulb lighting our scene, but again, you're kind of stuck with the, the sharp, sharp edge um, shadows, which I don't like. So if they, if you're really not going to be, if, if the light really isn't going to, you're not going to see the, the shadows from it that much, and you want to use it as a fill light, then that would be useful. Um, <clears throat> what I also use point lights for, um, what you can do, as I said, a fill light. So what if I wanted to exclude one of these objects? Well, what we can do is down here where it says objects. Right now, if I want to exclude any one of these, and let's go ahead and click one of them. That was the floor. Let's go back up here. Let's see which one this one is. And that happens to be the cone. And you can see it just goes to black because it's not being lighted by it. We can go back to the next one. And that's the sphere. So you can exclude them, which is ni nice. It's something that you really can't do in the real world. Um, you can't, um, if you're using a real light, um, it will light whatever is next to it. And in the instance with computer graphics, with 3D modeling, you can have it in a scene and have it light only the objects that you want or use it as a little fill light. 
that if you feel, for example, that this is too dark over on the right side, then put a little point light and turn off all the other objects so that it only affects that light. And you can also turn off its shadow. So it does not, if you look here under shadows, that maybe you don't want it to cast shadows, but you do want it to illuminate the surface. So that would be a good thing to do. Okay, so that's a point light. Let's go back again, and I'm gonna go ahead and turn inverse distance back on. And let's switch from a point light to a spherical light. That was the one that I was gonna show you again. Now, initially that looks very similar. And let's look again at the basics of it. And it starts off very small, 100 millimeters. But if I crank that up to um, one meter, okay, and I increase the intensity of it. Now, by creating, adjusting the size of it will affect the quality of the shadows. So let me go ahead and crank this up. And we can also change, yeah, we're gonna change that. So let's go ahead. I'm gonna make it 24 lux and see what I'm doing here. Okay, let's crank it up one more time, 36 lux. And notice because it's so close to the object, it's affecting, affecting the specular highlights, it's affecting the sphere more than the others. But because it is a one meter spherical light, notice how soft the shadows are. If I change that back to 100, 100 millimeters, the intensity of the light is the same, but look at how the shadows are affected. You're back to a really crisp shadow. So just by changing the size of it um, in you know, various increments, you can adjust the soft edges of the, the shadow. And that becomes, as I said, really, really important when you're finalizing your scene. So let's try another one. Um, I'm gonna go back from light, whoops. Instead of spherical light, let's go to spotlight. Spotlight, as I mentioned, is a cone of light. And you can see that it has abruptly changed how my scene looks. So to get a sense of what the object, what the light is pointing at, and you can do this with all of them, but it's most helpful um, to use this feature when you're using a spotlight, is I'm gonna switch back to, um, uh, let's just go back to wireframe, and then I know what I'm looking at here. Okay, you can see what the light is pointing at. You can actually see the rays from that. So what I want to do, though, is instead of viewing my scene through the current camera, I want to view it for the light view. Let's use the current light. So now what I'm doing is I can see, you know, as if I were, um, I think they're called gaffers, um, lighting specialists, that they're up there and they're pointing the spotlight at the um, actor or entertainer or, you know, person on stage. And now what I can do is I can take the and rotate this and we can ro let's rotate the light so that i can see that it's pointing at my scene now and if i want i can go ahead and switch back to let's go to perspective for example um let's go to perspective is it perspective view okay let's hit t for move and let's move this over slightly like so And I'm gonna go back to, um, instead of perspective, I'm gonna go back to light view again. And I'm gonna hit Y. And I want it to point at my scene again. There we go, okay. I think that will work. Now what you want to do is notice the little ring around this. This determines the fall off um, with cone um, uh, spotlights. 
because it is a cone of light. Um, by default, the um, spotlight soft edge angle is five degrees. If you want it to be really crisp, you want it to be zero. And then that little ring, inner ring, goes away. So let's switch from um, wireframe back to VPR. <clears throat> and we're looking at it through the light view, and you can see the, the really crisp edge here. If I switch from current light and I go back to camera view, look at how crisp that edge is around the, um, the where, where it's projected. Now, if I go back to um, five, whoops, let's go back to um, five degree angle is five degrees. Come on. You can also change the angle of the light. The angle of the light by default is 30 degrees. So if you want a really crisp, a narrow spotlight, you can do that. Um, and if you want, want something that's much wider, you can do that as well. So let me go back out of here. I think this is really affecting the intensity. Of the, my computer is starting to slow down. So let's go back down here and let's see if I can't select this now. Well, I'm going to close this and I'm going to bring light properties back up. And let's try again. There we go. Let's go back to five or even 10 degrees. And let's look at this as um, in a VPR. Now look at how soft it is. Okay. And again, if I want it more intense, then change the intensity. Um, or if I'm not going to use volumetrics, and that's what I was going to do next, try to get the volumetrics working here. So in order to get volumetrics working, notice that I have volumetrics by default with all the lights turned on. Um, and that's what we're going to do now is I'm going to go back to um, render because this is where you would turn it on at the very end. And I'm going to look at render properties. And under volumetrics, okay, select indirect sampling. Also use um, volumetric scattering and boom that turns it on now you can see the intensity of this now if you really want to blow out your scene or you have, have a really intense volumetric light and you know typically you do see that with spotlights in some form you can control how soft the edge is you can actually add particles in the here you can do all sorts of things with it. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back here. And where we have volumetrics, let me change here. Um, I have to look. Yeah, volumetric intensity is set to 100%. So let's go down to maybe 25% and see what we have. That's more like it. Okay, I have a nice soft edge. Um, the light, you know, it, it gives me the sense that it's a stage now. Really pretty cool. And not every light has volumetrics, but you will notice as you use the lights, whether they do or they don't, it will say, do you want it to volumetrics to be used or affected or not? Okay, so notice that I've been changing these. The scene, a simple still life, changes pretty dramatically just with the lighting. Another thing that we can do too, which is really pretty cool, and that's why I've kind of ended on the um, <coughs> the, um <coughs> the spotlight, is because we can use this as a projector. 
We can project an image to create the illusion, for example, that light is shining through a window. We can also um, project as if it were a, a projector, a solid image that goes through it and is layered on top of everything. Now, if we want it to, to be used as a cookie or a kukulora, then what we would do down here where it says projector image, right now it says none. Well, I'm going to go ahead and I want to load an image and let's see what happens here. And hopefully it goes to the correct um, folder that I have established. Yeah, Zoom and <clears throat> Lightwave are taxing my computer now, so it's really slowing down. That's what happens throughout the day. What can I say? There we go. So now I'm inside scenes. I want to go inside. And here is, <clears throat> I'm going to use the window pane that I used for the last demonstration that I did. It just has the panes and nothing else. So now I'm projecting that. <clears throat> And now it looks like a light is shining through a window. And if I invert that, okay, if I were to take that and invert that, um, it would look, you know, considerably different. But you can see right now that it's um, projecting what it's doing here is it's allowing with the, the white area, or was it the black, to, sh to shine through. Pretty cool. Um, we could also switch, and I'll show you what it, what happens when, and for example, if we were to change the, the color of the light to kind of like a deep blue, or maybe even a light blue, an intermediate blue, you'll get the sense that, you know, it's light coming through a window at night. Okay, pretty cool. And this is all, again, there's amazing what you can do with lighting. I'm going to go back again to white. And instead of using this black and white image, and this is called a cookie or kukulora, um, which is used in film all the time to simulate things that don't really exist in the scene. So what I'm going to do instead of the white panes, is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna send another image. Come on. <clears throat> and I'm gonna use one of the images that we used for um, for backdrop. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and I'm going to use the sand, the river image. We could use the reboot one. Why not use him? Um, where's the reboot? Here? Yeah, here's the reboot. I'll just use this one. Yeah, I'll use the river image and click OK. It will take a minute to catch up. Now you can see that it's acting as a projector and it's actually projecting an image of that, <clears throat> that river scene that we have available to us on the entire scene here. So again, it's a good way of dressing up a scene and making it look pretty dramatic without doing much else, just all through lighting. Okay. There's one more thing with regard to lighting that I want to show you, um, but that will have to wait for Monday. Um, and that is to use the light stage. 
And that's something that I recommend that most of you use um, for your toy assignment. <clears throat> and uh, for those of you even working in uh, Blender, if you choose to do something very similar to it, um, it sets up a nice stage with key lights, with um, um, uh, backlighting and fill lights um, for you already, but it was set up for an older version of Lightwave. So you do need to make some changes with regard to the intensity of the lights, but it also comes with this big bowl. And I mentioned this the other day. So that it's equivalent to having a seamless um, stage where you can't see the corners or the, the, you know, where the floor meets the wall. And those can become a distraction, especially when you're trying to showcase a product. Okay. So um, that's pretty much unless you guys have questions today, that's pretty much all I wanted to cover today. I encourage you when you're working with your toy and it definitely when you're working on your, your final project of playing with lighting to create, um, I think a much more, uh, what's, um, what's the word that I'm going for? Um, I think, uh, inter you know, interesting scene. Lighting can make or break a scene. And I guess the example that I always use is that if anyone has ever been to Disneyland and seeing the dark ride with the lights turned on, seeing a dark ride with the lights turned on, um, they don't look very interesting. So what has really made this, you know, made that, that ride interesting or um, really come to life is through lighting. And that the lighting can, can really make or break a scene. The surfacing can make or break a scene, but also the lighting. It can either bring it to life or it can make it fall flat. And that's something, that's why I'm having you with a toy to um, work with a very simple object, but create something interesting and elegant and realistic um, through the surface textures, and then also bring it to life, not only with the surface textures, but through lighting as well. And you'd be surprised, you know, I mean, I've just taken this simple little still life with balls and uh, a, a sphere and a cylinder and a, a cube and stuff, and it looks kind of interesting. Okay. And that's all done with a single light. So if there aren't any questions, a couple people have joined us. So, um, Okie doke. So if there aren't any more questions, um, or if you don't have any, need any feedback for your toy assignment, then that's it for today. Okay. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, I like lighting a lot, a lot, a lot. And the same with surface textures. That's where I really, um, and this is, lighting is also a specialization in, in, um, the computer graphics world. Um, there are people who specialize in building models and surfaces and people who animate and people who do um, um, lighting. <clears throat> Those are like four of the main. Uh, the, and the last one would be the rigging. So it is an area of specialization within the CG world. Okay. Well, that's um, all I wanted to say for today. So if you have anything, no. So I'm gonna say goodbye and I'm going to stop the recording and I'll have this posted in about an hour. Okay? Okay, bye-bye.